Before we begin, we would like to take a moment to thank MSD Ireland for sponsoring the Oncology Spotlight podcast. A sincere thanks to all of the MSD Ireland team for their continued support. Welcome listeners. Today we have Dr. Brenda Noonan, who is a lecturer and researcher at University College Cork School of Nursing and Midwifery. Prior to his academic career, he spent 16 years in the acute medical surgical nursing field. Dr. Noonan recently led a team of clinicians and researchers in exploring the feasibility of using a head and neck cancer patient's concerns inventory checklist in a clinical setting. He's also the principal investigator of the Liam Mack study, which you'll tell us more about now. Thank you for joining us today, Brendan. Um, I guess just to kick off, can you give us a brief introduction of yourself and your background? Yeah, no problem. And uh, delighted to be invited to speak. Uh, thank you very much. So my official title is um, Dr. Brendan Noonan. I'm a, a lecturer practitioner in the School of Nursing and Midwifery um, in University College Cork. And I've been in that position since 2005. Um, before that, um, I trained as a general nurse in Limerick University Hospital, and that was in 1995. And I registered as a general nurse um, in 1999. And then I worked in Limerick for approximately a year after that. And I worked in the general surgical field um, in Limerick University Hospital. And thereafter, I um, made the move back to my home county, Cork, back to the South Infirmary University Hospital. And that's where I started work um, in head and neck oncology, head and neck cancer care. Um, and I spent a number of years there before I um, not so much got tired of Cork, I better be careful with that. But I certainly um, I, I moved to Dublin and I started working in the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital for a number of years doing a higher diploma there uh, as, a, as a next course of study. And I worked for a time in St. James's Hospital before I returned to Cork. Um, and I went back to the South Infirmary before I got my job in the uh, UCC, in the School of Nursing Middle Free in UCC in 2005. Um, I suppose from a from a, a qualification point of view, it, we were the we were the first diploma group um, in Limerick outside of the traditional training of nurses and midwives. So we were that particular first diploma group that took three years. I, I did my degree in nursing in University College Cork. I went on to do my master's in nursing in University College Cork. I did a specific ear, nose and throat higher diploma in Dublin. Um, and more, or more recently, I've just completed a, not just, back in 2017, I completed a teaching and learning higher diploma um, for nurse tutors within University College Cork as well. And in 2016, I completed my doctorate um, in nursing. So that was a bit of a background. I suppose um, that's that's my 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 professional and academic qualifications i'm not sure you want to ask a few more questions in terms of that it's guess you know like everyone always seems to get uh, get dragged back to cork it seems at, at some point yeah uh, yeah absolutely yeah. well i i i certainly i had a uh, i met my wife during my wife now during training in limerick i was oh, one of God. 40 i was one of the only male in a class of 40 females and I, I might, might talk a little bit about that later on about more males in nursing I'm certainly an advocate um, yeah. for that um, but um, she was from Clare she is from County Clare and I was from County Cork so there was a bit of a battle on there for a while on mm -hmm. in terms of what county we would settle in um, oh, but, but certainly I got my way my, my wife is is nursing in the Cork University Hospital so we, we settled in, in Cork. Yeah, well, that brings us on to the next question. Why did you decide to pursue, uh, pursue a career in, in nursing and then to kind of dovetail that in terms of oncology? Like, what was the draw to yeah. oncology for you? Well, I went, my secondary school career was in St. Coleman's College in Formoy. And I don't know if you know anything about St. Coleman's College, but it's very much a, a hurling and football um, at the time. You know, there was hearty and hurling. and It was very much the, the focus of, of what went on in the, in the school. Great school, great secondary school. Um, for education, I really enjoyed it. But certainly nursing, when I met my guidance counsellor at that particular time, nursing wasn't mentioned as a career for a male at that particular time. So yeah. um, I, I, I was mostly influenced um, by family members, to be honest. Um, mm. my, my own mother um, was a nurse. I have two aunts who are nurses as well. And I suppose when, when I looked at my, my, my upbringing with my own mom and dad, I suspect we had a decent quality of life. Um, my mother really enjoyed her job um, and there was, seems to be a lot of job satisfaction out of that. So I, I certainly looked into it as a career. 
I was a little bit hesitant, to be honest, um, given that it wasn't your traditional uh, trajectory um, for a male to go into it back in 1995. Um, particularly general nursing, you would have had a lot of um, male nurses, um, you know, qualifying as mental health nursing. It was seen yeah. as, you know, more of a male orientated career to go into. But certainly we were a, we were a minority group within Ireland at the time in terms of that. But I, I, I love the idea. I, I used to listen to my mother in terms of stories that she was telling me that no day seemed to be the same. So I looked into it a little bit more and I spoke to a couple of people around who worked in different hospitals in Cork at the time when I was putting in my CEO application. And the opportunities were immense. Um, mm. You know, the, the, the not if you compare it to engineering, if you compare it to, you know, the traditional education route or whatever you wanted to go into, nursing had really, really good opportunities in terms of, you know, clinical work, in terms of management, um, in terms of education, in terms of where you want to work community abroad. It was it was wild, the opportunities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I said to myself, I'm going to give this a go, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And I took off to Limerick and I, I, I didn't stop since, you know, in terms of, in terms of going <laughs> and that's, you know, so it was really good. In terms of the oncology, like, was it a kind of a natural fit or did you, did you want to go into um, the oncology yeah. space? It's a good question, Owen. I suppose like, like any undergraduate student nurse and, and you know, that's my, my main focus. You know, one of my main focuses is lecturing, you know, in nursing midwifery, like any of those students at present, they're exposed to different placements throughout the four years that are program or the five years that are program in terms of the children's and general integrated program. So you will find when you meet those students, they will always tell you the positive experiences that they've had in certain areas. And I certainly had, re, uh, you know, met a really, really strong personality and really good leader in Limerick um, Hospital at the time, working in head and neck oncology. And whenever I was placed in that particular unit, I was I loved every minute of it. And, and I, I say that with the greatest respect, the, the complexity of cancer care is is really challenging. Um, you know, there's no same case, no same patient. Um, I really loved working in that area. And when I when I registered as a general nurse, I had a couple of choices, you know, where I wanted to work. But certainly that was one of the places I went back to. So I went back to that particular unit, knowing that that particular leader was working there. Uh, she was visionary. Um, you know, nothing was an issue. Um, she had career or she had, you know, she sat down with you in terms of career pathways and career planning. Um, and the care that was delivered in that particular unit was was top you know it was excellent you know really really excellent um in terms of care delivery so I, I requested to go back to that unit and work in that area and to be honest um the head and neck oncology world just opened up for me from there you know yeah. I I you know worked in Limerick you know went back to the south worked in head and neck oncology there a very difficult cancer actually you know a very um visible cancer in terms of yeah. out of all the other cancers you know it's it tends to be the most visible type out there so for some reason um i i fell in love with it i fell in love with the 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 patients caring for and um i just moved on from there mm-hmm. excellent very good what what led you into academia why did you move from uh, practicing nursing into academia yeah so i suppose i spent maybe it was 11 or 12 years you know immersed in clinical um, and immersed in delivering, you know, oncology care to patients and working with colleagues, obviously, in the South and different hospitals, as I've just mentioned at the start. And um, again, we always we always had undergraduate students with us and postgraduate students with us. So we would be preceptors what they were, you know, mentors to these students while they're out on placement. Um, mm-hmm. And I really enjoy teaching. So you would have people that, you know, are, you know, working with colleagues that, you know, wouldn't enjoy having students with them on a daily basis, you know, three or four days a week. But I used to love having students with me and uh, I took every opportunity to have a student with me. You know, they, they ask questions, they challenge you. Um, you know, I love teaching. I love demonstrating, practicing. Um, and, and, and the feedback from students was very positive. So an opportunity came up um, to deliver some small content within a module within the School of Nursing in UCC at the time. Um, one of the greatest leaders in nursing, Dr. Geraldine McCarthy, or Professor Geraldine McCarthy, was um, the head of school at the time. And we got a few hours. I got a few hours teaching on a module and I loved it. Um, and mm-hmm. um, the opportunity came up, a post came up. It was a lecture practitioner post whereby you would, it was, it was typical of a joint appointment post at the time 
whereby you would spend 50% of your time teaching in the university and you'd spend 50% of your time um, in clinical practice. Now, that's, mm. that's, that's, that's changed over time um, to more of a research role as opposed to providing direct patient care. So my teaching role exists, but the practitioner element changed to research and change implementation and working with departments in terms of questions that they might have about clinical and they don't know where to start in terms of examining the evidence and, and answering those and, and, and in terms of specific research questions and designing a study around those. So that, that's what mm. the role has evolved to in the last number of years, that lecture practitioner role. And now when I got into that role and developed that role, I now have clinical links across Cork City. We have clinical links to uh, Tipperary University Hospital, and we're constantly, while one of our roles is supporting students, we're constantly looking to collaborate on, on different research projects. And of mm. course, one of those research projects, I'm sure you're going to ask about it later, maybe would, have, would be right now is the, the Liam Mack trial. And, and there's a, been a couple of other uh, research projects that I would have been involved with over the years too, that, you know, that have made changes in, in terms of the care delivery pathways for, for uh, patients. Okay, cool. Hope could that you, makes sense. You, yeah, no, it does. It does. Um, I'm very interested in the research side of it. Could you, you know, and I know from looking at your your uh, profile on the University College Cork website, you're involved in a head and neck checklist. Is that right? Yeah. So that that was. Um, I spent some time over in. Um, sometimes it's the simplest things that make the biggest difference. But mm. I'm a big believer in that. The, the less complex things are, the more patients benefit from I, I'm a firm believer. So I spent some time over in Aintree University Hospital in Liverpool um, with a consultant called Professor Simon Rogers. And it was an opportunity for me to go there. It was a, an award that I received at the time, a clinical award to travel to a place where I'd like to spend time working clinically. And that place that I chose was Liverpool Aintree University Hospital and specifically working with a gentleman called Professor Simon Rogers, who's retired now, but again, is a huge leader in terms of head and neck cancer. And when I, when I went to Liverpool at that particular time, uh, Simon was um, exploring the use of a holistic needs assessment tool. And that holistic needs assessment tool for patients with head and neck cancer was termed the patient concerns inventory. So it was a head and neck patient concerns inventory. And, and I hope I've, I, I just explained that a little bit. What it is, is a, it turned out to be 57 item concerns list that patients complete in an outpatient environment prior mm -hmm. to going in to see their consultant. So you, Kevin, mm -hmm. arrive into the outpatient department, you know, in the middle of treatment or just post your diagnosis or post treatment, and you would be given this particular inventory, this 57 item inventory, and you would tick the concerns and issues that you have right now in your life. And they could range from physical concerns to psychological concerns, to, you know, to social concerns, all of those particular areas. You might have one and someone else might have 30 or someone else might have 10 in terms of where they are with their treatment. And I saw this in operation in, in Liverpool. And when I sat in with Simon during the consultations and the patient arrived in and Simon had an opportunity to look at the inventory prior to the patient coming in and the concerns became the focus of the consultation. So in other words, it was no patient driven as opposed yeah. to be consultant driven. And I thought that was absolutely amazing for the first mm. time in a long time. What I was seeing and I would have done a lot of work with consultants instead of just doing a physical assessment and asking questions that the perhaps the consultant or registrar was interested in. Now it was being reversed completely. And Simon was now saying to the patient, he was saying, I note here on your inventory, you've got a concern in relation to the following, in relation mm -hmm. to fatigue, in relation to the way you look, in relation to, you know, not managing saliva or still having trouble, you know, swallowing and all of those mm -hmm. particular issues. So it became completely patient driven. So that was they, they were looking at the at exploring that inventory. So they were conducting a number of small studies with the head and neck group. They were conducting studies with a, a breast cancer group and gynecology group, and that ex expanded over the years. So of course I landed back to Cork, and I am um, at the time I was working in in the school um, of nursing in in UCC in Midwifery in UCC, and I approached the head and neck team within the South Infirmary, and I said I've got an idea. Um, it's not my idea, but certainly it's been used over in Liverpool. And I think we should look at, you know, look at this as the holistic needs assessment tool. So as I explained, the lecture practitioner role is all about exploring research opportunities with clinical. So explore that with them. 
Um, Professor Sheehan, at the time, Patrick Sheehan, was leading out in that particular department, still is to this day. And we looked at the feasibility of implementing a head and neck, that same patient inventory, that concerns inventory, into clinical in the South Infirmary Victoria University Hospital, the regional head and neck cancer centre. We did work um, we sat down with um, the clinical people. We made changes, some slight changes to the inventory that will be more representative of the Irish population in terms of certain terminology to the inventory mm -hmm. itself. And we ran it. We implemented it as a feasibility study. We recruited over 130 patients over six months. We collected data. Ultimately, the aim of the study was feasibility. But we were also able to collect at that time what were the concerns, what were the needs that these patients were having over that particular six months. They were all post-treatment, this particular group. And we ran it and we identified some really important points. First of all, we said that it was feasible to run, that patients mm. loved the fact that their concerns were being identified and driving the consultation. Yeah. Um, because consultations yeah. can be quite short. You know, they can be five or yeah. six or seven minutes. And, and the mm. level of support that you get through that is very important for the patient. The nursing staff didn't have an issue with it, so it didn't disrupt the outpatient process. The consultants um, were very positive in terms of use, nervous, mind you. And, and I say that with the greatest respect. They were nervous in terms of not having the answers to the questions that were asked on that particular concerns list. And of course, the the reassuring point to that is they don't need to have the answers. You know, it's mm. about, you know, I, might, I, I don't know how um, to answer that particular question, how best to offer you support, but I do know who, or I know a person who does. So it yeah. really gave an avenue into the multidisciplinary team by, I think you should talk with Deirdre Callan, who was the advanced nurse practitioner, now the advanced nurse practitioner in Head and Neck in the South. And um, so it was, it was feasible and we explored it. We published on it. We presented on it. And in Deirdre Callanan, who's now the advanced nurse practitioner in head and neck oncology, is using this particular inventory in her nurse-led clinic in terms mm -hmm. of identifying needs. Um, and it was a real good change. And I suppose, um, so I'm probably talking a little bit too much about it now, but I'm quite passionate about it, as, as you can hear. Not only does it identify needs at that particular time, but you can now look at a patient who had a need back in January identified and have they still got that need when they come back in 12 months time? Are they still mm -hmm. identifying that as a concern? So as healthcare professionals, what are we doing? You know, they're still coming back 12 months with still a concern about that. This needs to be addressed. And there's a lot of published literature on unmet needs. And this tool is all about meeting unmet needs um, that are a priority for the patient. Yeah. It's great to hear that it's still in, it's still in, after the feasibility, it's, it's, it's being used and utilized and it's been benefited from um, in the Munster region. Anyway, is there is there interest to expand it outside? Yeah, I think I, I think there should be. I think there should be on, and I think there is. I mean, you know, through the different conferences we presented at and the different um, areas that I move around, they're certainly interested, or there's certainly interest out there in terms of you know expanding this out into different patient groups, just not in, in head and neck cancer. You know, yeah. in, in terms of breast cancer, in terms of, of 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 gynecological cancers and so on, all different cancers, because it's a very simple tool. Um, yeah. we, we, you know, we, we certainly want to to look at expanding it into other areas. Well, and that's that's probably the next part of this particular project is liaising with other groups outside of Cork. I might not even outside of Cork, but liaising with other um, groups um, who are delivering care to other types of cancer patients and see if we can expand this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose it's interesting to understand the behavioural change and trying to see how to integrate it into different hospitals, kind of the integration process and getting buy-in from all the different actors. Yeah, it's it's it. it's huge actually. Yeah, and you know, yeah. it, it's it's you know, you always need a leader, um, in a specific yeah. area because while I'm coming from academia and I have a clinical background. You always need some some person that is as passionate about this as you are, in terms of opening those gates and and looking at the feasibility of this, you know. And that's that's sometimes difficult because everybody is very busy in what they're doing, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. adding something else needs to be sold as lessening the burden, um, as opposed to increasing the burden on healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. And that's key. And this particular tool does that because you can identify who is in need of um, additional or more 
support and those patients who are absolutely coping very well with their, you know, on their cancer trajectory and may not be, need to be seen on a yearly basis. Maybe based on this concerns checklist, we can say that the follow-up now can change to two, three years, three years. Obviously, that's dependent on the risk in terms of their original diagnosis and prognosis as well. Just thinking about the practical implementation, is it literally a clipboard and piece of paper in, a, in the clinic, in the waiting room that the patient... Yeah, so so certainly when I went to Liverpool, it was they were they were they had using iPads, so they were using mm. you know electronic devices. So in other words, you know, a patient could either complete it at home, so they could complete mm. it at home, and before they even came in, it was completed and it, it was it was up on the system for the consultant or registrar or advanced nurse practitioner to look at. So that there was no there was no time in spending in time and waiting and completing. Not that there is time in that, but there was no, should I say, any additional task for the patient to do when they came into the outpatient department. If they did come in and it wasn't completed, they were in Liverpool. They were handed a device. Um, I'm saying an iPad. It's, it doesn't need to be an iPad. It could be an Android device. I'm just using that as an example, mm-hmm. you know. And therefore, it would be electronic. Um, it would be saved on the patient's file immediately, and it would be instead of us having to take a paper copy and bring it into the consultant's room, it was immediately came up the desktop, and that was really, really useful. I'm not mm. sure how much you know about or how much you're aware of um, the IT structures within the HSE, um, you know, across all hospitals, but certainly it's a slow burner. Um, mm-hmm. and, and very reluctant in terms of making changes to, you know, existing infrastructure. Um, and and we, 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 we continue to work with them in terms of how best we can make these changes. But, but you know, since, the, since you know, we've, we've had maybe some, not so much, but no, over the last number of years, we've had some, you know, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, uh, attacks on the HSE yeah. systems or on the IT yeah. systems that have caused huge problems. And, therefore, and then introducing something else, past that particular firewall or getting past that firewall is difficult but that's 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 not that's nothing that, that's that's something that's a challenge that's that's something that can be done and again you're looking for leaders you're looking for people within mm-hmm. IT that can go yeah that's possible we, we can do that and, and we're we meet those leaders and that's our next stage as well we certainly want this to become electronic you know um, it's yeah. the way forward we don't want paper copies um, you know in terms of that and, and, and electronic is the way forward so this is something that can simply be done that way as well but it just takes a little bit of time yeah of course of course um, what 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 kind of objections were you getting from like in, inside in the clinic you know when you go to a new clinic what would be the the main objections you'd, you'd see from from staff yeah yeah i think i think the you, you, when you go into a clinic like that they have a system in place and and this the system in place is that you know patient comes in um, you know, they, they meet with their the, the nurse, you know, they, the systems differ, obviously, you know, they're maybe a set of vital signs or maybe a weight is taken and, and you know, they're, they're, that's, a system is in place and, and the clinics run smoothly in terms of that. If you try and introduce something new, it, it, it must be sold in such a way that it must not disrupt the, 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 the process, you know, the, or mm. that it delays or increases time. And that was one of the biggest difficulties, Kevin was mm. that there was a there was a potential here that this particular tool would um would um add additional time to an already busy clinic you know mm. um and in fact over time in all the studies and research that have been done over time across the UK and across other european countries using the PCI it's been proven now that actually it makes the clinic more efficient in terms of the uh, the consultation because the consultation becomes much more focused. This is my concern. Mm. Let's talk about that. And there, there's no loose talk in terms of anything else. So it becomes a very much a focused consultation. So there was very there was concerns about that disruption. There was concerns about the elongation or the adding time to clinics, but they were they were pretty much abated by the findings of the study. Um, in terms of, and, and I mentioned the other concern as well, not knowing how to address every single need. Yeah. Remember, there's 57 items on the list. Mm. We, we had cases where, you know, a consultant would say to me, I, I sat in in a lot of the clinics, and the consultant would say to me, Brendan, he says, this, 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 um, this patient here has ticked every single, every single item, you know, so they've, they've ticked 57 items. How do you expect me to address yeah. 57 yeah. items? You know, and the answer to that is you don't. This is a patient that is obviously not coping. You know, this mm. is so you, you, in that particular scenario, you would put you would put away the inventory and you'd push yeah. that aside and you'd say, John or Mary or whatever you'd say, or Raj or whoever it is, you would say, 
how are things? So you, you, you'd, you'd actually open it up in terms of, you know, what's happening right now. I, you know, I see from this, you're, you're, you've got a lot of concerns. So where do, where do we start from here? How do we, how do we, how do we begin to improve some of, some of these items for you? You know, so that was a real concern. You know, you, you had other concerns such as, you know, fear of cancer recurrence. That's a bit, that's, that's a common one that came up all the time is ticked by people. And that became a, a real concern for patients over time. And consultants were, and, and the, the nursing staff were a little bit afraid of that one, not so much afraid, but reluctant to talk about that particular one and how to address it. And, and again, that was my part of my role was reassuring them that mm. sometimes a fear of reoccurrence, one of the greatest things we can do when someone says that to, them is to us is to acknowledge that, yes, this is a real concern. That the the potential for this to reoccur is real, you know, um, mm. and sometimes it's a simple acknowledgement of that um, uh, allays, allays that fear, and we can we can work with that in terms of, of providing support and amongst the MDT team as well. Yeah, very good. Very good. I suppose we'll we'll definitely link to the to the feasibility study and the show notes of this podcast anyway. So for anyone who wants to kind of find out more we can link to that anyway but i suppose moving on to the next topic of discussion um that we were drawn to i suppose particularly what we heard about was uh the trial that you're working on the liam mack trial um brendan so yeah would you be able to just in detail give us some um uh, insight into that please yeah so um again um this was a a potential uh should i say intervention that clinical colleagues in the Cork University Hospital working with men with genitourinary cancer, prostate cancer and malignancies and so on, um, discussed with us, a, a few members of the team within the school. And, and they had a couple of potential um, intervention, an intervention that they'd love to implement or they would like to explore implementing. So it was driven by clinical colleagues um, and they had a number of ideas in terms of um, rolling out a survivorship pathway for men. Um, we convened a group and we looked at these particular, the particular intervention that they would have liked to have implemented. And we tied it in with a call from the Irish Cancer Society at that time. And they put out a funding grant at that time that was specifically focusing on developing a cancer survivorship pathway for men. So there was a funding source available to us that we could apply for and that would fit in beautifully with developing an intervention for these particular um, men in terms of a survivorship pathway. We know that the consequences of cancer, you know, for and its treatment for men in particular can cause a lot of difficulties. You know, there's a lot of difficulties in terms of, you know, um, masculinity, in terms of erectile dysfunction, in terms of weight gain, in terms of sleep disturbance and, and continence issues. So there's a huge amount of concerns and issues in terms of these specific cancers and these genital urinary cancers. So um, we put in an application to the ICS and we were successful in funding for that. And the name of this particular um, uh, project, this particular program, was the Lee Mac Trial. And the Lee Mac Trial is short for uh, linking in um, with advice and supports for men um, impacted by metastatic cancer. And particularly for this particular feasibility study, um, we're looking at uh, people or men with genitourinary metastatic cancer. Um, it's a study that will be intervention study that will be kicking off this month, actually, in February. Um, we had hoped to kick it off a little bit earlier, but we had to wait on ethics approval. And that's all over. That's, that's across the board now. So we're really excited to roll out this particular intervention study commencing in February. Um, so what does it look like or what's it about? Mm. It's about providing a 12-week survivorship pathway for men um, who have been diagnosed with a metastatic cancer such as the GU cancer. And that 12-week interventional program um, with the support of the um, CUH staff, and I mentioned a couple of those in a little while, with support from the clinical trials group within the UC University College Cork, and with support of um, the Irish Cancer Society, we have, we have developed a 12-week interventional program that will um, be run over 12 weeks, and we will have approximately, over that particular next two years, we'll have approximately 70 men or up to 75 or 80 men involved in that 12-week intervention. Now, that 12-week intervention, you might ask, you know, what does it look like? Mm. So 
successfully recruited onto the program, meeting certain inclusion criteria, we're initially going to start with six men. And these six men will have had a diagnosis of prostate cancer. And mm-hmm. they will receive, <coughs> excuse me, over the 12 weeks of the program, they'll receive specific interventions from the MDT team. So they will receive interventions um, t- t- from dietitians, from physiotherapies, or physiotherapists, from clinical nurse specialists over the 12 week, and they'll receive social care, spiritual care, and all, and always being, um, should I say, um, uh, referred out to other additional supports as deemed necessary over the 12 weeks as well. It's running out of the cardio rehab gym in the, in the Unicork University Hospital. Um, at the six week time point, we will recruit an additional six men to start off on that 12 week journey as well. So we'll be a rolling running. It's a rolling call or rolling in, um, implementation um, of the program over that number of weeks. I suppose um, the purpose behind it is to see if, if we can if we can run a comprehensive multidisciplinary program an interventional program for men and how feasible is it are we able to run this so we're, we'll be certainly looking at feasibility um over that 12 weeks and back to feasibility again but ultimately the aim of this to see if it works is it feasible is it feasible for the mdt team to intervene over 12 weeks and obviously part of the feasibility <clears throat> we'll be looking at the participants experiences um, how effective the interventions were in terms of physio, in terms of nursing input, in terms of dietetic input, in, ster- in terms of social input. So a lot of questionnaires over the 12 weeks in terms of the impact or the perceived effectiveness of those particular components. And we'll also be looking at the acceptability of that study as well. So that's, that's I probably went on a little bit long in terms of that, mm-hmm. but certainly it's very exciting. Um, yeah. We currently have a women's cancer survivorship pathway intervention going on at present in Cork mm. called the LISA trial. We're mapping that and we're using a lot of that, what we've learned from that particular trial to develop this particular interventional study. It's the first of its kind in Ireland. Um, we're very excited by it. Um, we have our, uh, you know, our PPI representatives on board with us and they work very closely in terms of how to design this particular intervention. Um, and we can't wait to get going, to be honest. Um, it's really exciting. And of course, that's yeah. it's it's the PIs on this particular project, the principal investigators and myself, and Dr. Richard Bambury as well, and uh, Dr. Jack Gleason is a is a primary investor, principal investigator on the project as well. You mentioned the Lisa trial. Um, so, what like what are you kind of mirroring or taking from that trial? I know that's been running for the last two years. I think. Yeah, so that's that's ongoing and it's it's yeah. it's it's moving and it's expanding all the time. And we, we certainly are looking at some of the interventions that they um, implemented um, for women with breast cancer. And we're dealing with men with prost- can- prostate cancer. Yeah. So we're, we're certainly um, learning from how well they implemented their particular intervention over that time. And, you know, um, we're certainly looking at the dietetic input, the physio input. Um, but, but specifically, I suppose, we're learning how well it was implemented over time and the problems that they came up against in terms of an example of that own would be terms of inclusivity, you know, how to ensure that you're getting at the men that you want to be involved in this particular study. One of the target groups that we want to get into this particular intervention studies are those from disadvantaged um, backgrounds from, you know, from, from uh, ethnic minority groups, and the LBGT community, all of those particular groups, we were trying to, you know, um, uh, recruit those particular men in particular um, as part of uh, the, the, this particular intervention study and getting them into this particular study. And that's one of our aims. And so we, we will look at that very closely when we're looking at eligible participants in terms of, of, terms of inclusion in the study. Um, one of the things would be that, you know, from the LISA trial that we learned is you know, we want men to be sustained. The 12-week intervention is in to engage with it for the full 12 weeks and how best yeah. 
to support them in in terms of you know not dropping out or not being able to make you know a number of weeks so we certainly want to learn from that and and one of the learning points in lisa trial would be <clears throat> that we, we we provide supports and if that's financial support then you know part of our funding model for that is providing you know financial supports for men to be able to attend as simple as covering parking costs you know reimbursing mm-hmm. traveling costs in terms of that because that's all out of pocket stuff that will mm-hmm. that will you know um should i say exclude men from participating so simple stuff like that we've learned we don't think from our ppi representation on the project um, martin we feel that he, he would have been very he, he would have been very excited by an interventional uh, pathway such as this so he has the opportunity he would have loved an opportunity like this to engage in in a 12 week intervention um, so he doesn't think we'd have a, an issue or a problem with, um, you know, recruiting men onto the onto the uh, program or onto the, the the intervention itself. You know, we might be overly, um, uh, should I say, um, subscribed, but he doesn't think we'd have an issue with that. Excellent. Could you tell me how you define survivorship? Yeah. So I suppose you know survivorship is broadly defined as living with, um, living through. And living beyond the cancer diagnosis, you know, they, they, there's there's a lot of talk about that in the literature in terms of that. So, you 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 survivorship might be anyone who's just received a diagnosis and they begin their survivorship journey, and the decisions that have to be made, and the sim- and the treatment pathways that they go through, and the symptoms as a result of that. Um, mm. And that's the true element of a survivorship trajectory. And that's one of the we have a group within the School of Nursing and Midwifery called the ECAS group. And that a research group within the school, and we very much look at the the survivorship program and survivorship pathways for for patients and exploring those in terms of that trajectory. So I, I would define survivorship, Kevin, as as the trajectory that you know patients take, um, living with cancer, living through treatment and the symptoms that the, and that they that they encounter during their treatment, and obviously beyond cancer treatment as well. We have mm. you know cancer survivors. But so certainly the definition of survivorship has expanded, not just after finishing treatment, um, um, but certainly living with and living beyond and at diagnosis as well. In, in, and in terms of Liam Mack, it'll be patients who are receiving treatment at that time will be. Yes. Participants yeah. So, at, 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 you know, at a stage. You know, there's sort of be men with metastatic cancer, you know, um, and certainly will be they will have their diagnosis, um, you know, will be on treatment um, yeah. or maybe finish treatment in terms of their treatment pathway at present. So mm-hmm. I, I should reiterate that any all of these particular men will have their, you know, they, they, the intervention study is complementary to the care that they're getting, that they're being provided by their oncology team. So they, you know, it doesn't take them away from that. It's complementary to the care that they're being, that's being delivered by their oncology team at that particular time. So we're, yeah. we're, we're careful to, to, to state that, that it's complementary. There's specific inclusion criteria in terms of where they're at on their cancer trajectory at that particular time and whether they're um, eligible or to be included in the intervention too. So it's very much in, in, a complementary to the care that they're being received at present from their oncology team. And that's how they'll be identified. You know, we're hoping that the oncology team, the consultants, the advanced nurse practitioners, you know, through those MDT meetings, will be able to identify men who would be mm. ideal candidates for or engaging in this particular survivorship pathway for men that's being tailor-made for these particular people as well. Okay. Okay. And Brennan, like I suppose the whole trial itself is from the start, the, I suppose from the beginning, the phase, it seems like there's been a, an awful lot of input from it's a CUH, from a university, from can, uh, the cancer, Irish Cancer Society. Yep. Like there, there, there seems to be an awful lot of upfront um, in terms of organizing and preparing for a trial. Like, like what was the timeline? Um, and kind of the how do the conversations begin? Because yeah, it's it's a really good question, actually, Owen. And I think it's really good for people who are who are thinking about you know this particular yeah. journey themselves, or you know answering questions like this. It takes time. Um, it, it's it's certainly collaborative. Um, it's certainly as and that, that's my point at the start. In order for this to be successful, um, it really has to be driven as a need from clinical, you know, that the need is identified from the clinical partners um, in mm. these particular projects. 
uh, and then we can sit down together. For any trial to be successful, you have to have a number of parties on board. You know, without funding from the Irish Cancer Society, this project wouldn't be possible. So, you know, that, that it just would not be feasible. You, you couldn't run a project like this without funding from the, the likes of the Irish Cancer Society who are instrumental in terms of providing that support. You know, this funding has allowed us to employ over the, over the next two years a dedicated dietitian on this interventional study. It's allowed us to employ a dedicated physiotherapist. And, you know, it's allowed us to, you know, buy or to, to have, you know, an advanced practitioner time, advanced nurse practitioner time dedicated to this particular project. So funding is key. In terms of logistics and organization and all of that, we're very lucky in UCC and um, that we have a cancer trials group. Um, and that cancer trials group is, is very much instrumental in making sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted in terms of what needs mm -hmm. to happen next in terms of ethics approval, in terms of risk assessment, in terms of GDPR, in terms of all that particular communication. And then there's the finance element to it in terms of contracts and agreements. There's the ethics element to it in terms of getting ethics approval and having all that particular um, uh, documentation in place, your questionnaires, your interventions, your data collection, your data storage. So a trial is a monster in itself mm -hmm. and it only works on, on if there's a, a really strong relationship between the people who are collaborating on this particular project. And that's from UCC's perspective, the clinical trials group. It's from the clinical people who make this happen in terms of delivering the intervention. It's the Irish Cancer Society in terms of providing the financial support and guidance support from previous experience. And it's the academic, academics such as ourselves um, in terms of being able to help in terms of research designs, data analysis, and all of that particular area. Um, all it, so it's, it's complex, but mm -hmm. it works really well if there are um, very clear defined roles in terms of responsibility and accountability across that particular trial. And ultimately, we shouldn't forget it only works. Um, you know, the, benefit, the benefits of this particular trial are for men, you know, mm -hmm. um, in improving their uh, symptoms, improving their outcomes, and ultimately improving their quality of life. So, on while I might state this perhaps as an interventional or a, 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 a survivorship pathway study, we are hoping at the end of this, and we're looking at feasibility, obviously, we're hoping at the end of this that the men, the 72 gentlemen that have, have engaged in this particular intervention, it has actually, actually had an impact on their quality of life, you know, um, and that's mm. ultimately so we can feed back on that and get that evidence. And then and then look at this as a trial proper going forward. What I mentioned by that is maybe looking at a randomized control trial, looking at multiple sites and expanding this out to other sites and larger numbers where we can truly look then at implementing this as part of standard care. You know, I mentioned the PCI earlier in our chat implemented a standard care quite a small study made a simple difference in terms of quality of life and when we move to survivorship pathways and large fundings in terms of studies it's imperative that the evidence is there before we can expand out to larger groups and larger sizes as well and i should say we're, we're starting with genital urinary cancer i would think i would love to think and we discussed this as a group as well i would love to think that we can advance this out to other groups such as head and neck cancer and other mm -hmm. cancer groups and look at survivorship pathways that are tailor made for those particular men because we know uh, kevin and Owen, that if we address unmet needs in a timely fashion um, and what i mean by timely fashion in a time that it's of most concern to the patient then we avoid um long term problems and concerns and cope and not coping with certain um, uh, complex problems over time. So therefore you avoid readmissions, you avoid costly interventions, you avoid unnecessary time at that particular. So that, I hope that makes sense. So yeah. we know from research that if we address unmet needs in a timely manner, that it avoids complexities down the road, you know, and that's mm. what these particular pathways are, are about. Brilliant. That's, that sounds that sounds really, really great. Um, I would ask OGU around the corner, um, I think mid-February it's, it's going to be on. Is there anything, any abstracts or any research you're looking forward to reading about or have you been keeping an eye on it? Yeah, I suppose it's something that's it's certainly on our agenda to, to explore. Um, we, we certainly would look at, from, from even this particular 
um, intervention study that we've designed as a, as a team. Um, we certainly are very close to publishing ourselves. We, we've done a scoping review looking at the interventions in terms of uh, cancer survivorship interventions for this group of, of, of men. So we're, we're certainly going to publish that. And I would hope actually, Kevin, that we would be, you know, the dissemination ourselves over time will, will include, you know, submitting abstracts um, to the likes of those particular conferences coming up, even local, mm -hmm. no national and international conferences such as this. We're very much at the beginning of this particular project. Um, you know, we had hoped that we begin a little bit sooner, and, but that's okay. You know, we, we, we just had to go through, obviously, the correct, um, the correct um, uh, loopholes in terms of, not so much loopholes, but the correct, I'm um, looking for a word. Um, you can help me with a word maybe here, but the, mm -hmm. the correct stages in terms of getting approval for the study. And we're at that stage now, um, and we will begin recruitment in the next two weeks, which is really exciting. And then we'll be looking at those particular um, conferences and particular dissemination pathways as well, you know. Yeah. Is there anything else like has there any similar study been done in any anywhere around the world? Yeah, so you know the scoping review that we're doing right now has identified lots of different interventional pathways across Europe and across America um and and, and so on. Um and the the evidence is quite strong to suggest that they, they work, you know. Um mm. not nothing has been done in particular to this particular group, or very little has been published in terms of this particular group of men that we're looking at, the GU cancer uh, group. Um, but certainly, and perhaps the way we've designed our 12-week intervention is based on that particular evidence. So we've mm -hmm. we've designed it in such a way that we know that physio input is extremely important and has worked in different studies. We know that dietetic input is extremely important at certain stages throughout that particular 12 weeks. We know that if we take care of social care and spiritual care, it has a huge you know, knock-on impact in terms of coping. The nursing input and the, and the broad area of support provided by you know, our AMP on the, on the project, Anita Cahill, we know that that works. So what we're trying to do with this particular intervention is put it all together as a, as a package. Mm, and yeah. and studies, have, studies have looked at the individual elements and now we're going to see whether this works as a package in itself. You know? And Bernard, I suppose, like, I suppose the trial, is like, it's a, it seems like quite a big trial in terms of different areas, uh, physical, diet, dietary yep. needs. And all. Is there any, like, I suppose, what, what part of the outcomes of the study did it excite you? Or is there anything in particular in focus that you like to see in terms of at the end of the, like, is there anything within the trial that really excites you to, to see what the outcomes are? Yeah, I suppose. I suppose we certainly will be collecting a lot of baseline information on, you know, our baseline data at the very beginning in terms of, um, in terms of the different quality of life instruments that we're using, and, and I'll certainly be interested, like, albeit the, the feasibility and the elements that feed into the feasibility are will obviously be of interest. But I'll be certainly really interested from my perspective, and from mm -hmm. my clinical hat on to see if this 12-week intervention has made a difference or not in terms of quality of life. I know our physiotherapist yeah. on the project, um, Stephanie, you know, will we'll have her physio hat on during the 12 of weeks course. in terms yeah. of muscle gain um, and so on like that and weight maintenance throughout in terms of our, our dietitian. So we all have different hats on. We all have different areas of interest. I know, for example, Jack, will be particularly interested in terms of quality of life as well, you know. Um, and I have a particular interest in quality of life. And I know that Anita has a particular interest in psychological elements of the program and how psychological coping will be improved or not in terms of the 12-week intervention. One would think that the 12 weeks intervention would be a real bonus. And it would, you know, but you, you just never know in terms of the level of commitment that's needed from the men to engage in a 12 week program, yeah. that might be a, 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 neg a negative element of it. So we really need to get that feedback and it'll be really exciting to read, um, you know, after the 12 weeks, how these men found the program or was it too much? Was it too little? Did they mm -hmm. need more of something else? Or do they need less of something else? You know, it'll be really good to catch up in a year's time just to see how the study yeah. scores. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, and I'd, I'd be very keen on that too. The more, the more, more opportunities we get to publicise this, the great. You know, because people have lots of ideas across the country and across um, Europe and, and outside of Europe in terms of different questions that they might want to answer as well. You know, so yeah, absolutely, yeah. that's a really good point. Brilliant. I, I should um, mention as well, and just to just before. Um, we move on or to the next question. And I need to mention that 
you know, um, within that 12 week program, and I've mentioned the, the, the dietetic and physio and nursing input and so on, the, the voluntary areas are, are aligned with this particular program as well. So the voluntary supports outside of the hospital setting have very much come on board this particular project as well. So the likes of our house that provide, you know, support yeah. um, in terms of that cancer survivorship pathway as well. Um, and we'll be very keen on that as well, Owen and, and Kevin, in terms of, you know, making sure that, you know, outside of the dietetic element and the physio element and the nursing element, that if we identify unmet needs that are outside of that particular remit, we will certainly be, you know, flagging that the, the support services to men where they can, you know, get additional support in terms of that. And there's a list of those available, and that's very important as well. And that's that's done, and that's that's becoming a real norm in oncology care at the moment. You know, we're always signposting patients out to additional supports that are available in the community, and that's really important. Whether they avail of them or not, you know, they do avail of them. Not all, not everybody avails of them, but certainly being aware that they're that they're there. Um, is very important and that's that that'll be a big part of this particular study as well raising awareness you know increasing the exposure to those particular supports that are available as well very cool very interesting um and just a final question brendan um for anyone any patients and caregivers reading this what are your tips on navigating cancer care um I suppose, as you as you as you can see, uh, Kevin, and, uh, that um, that I, I've spent fifty six minutes talking. You know, I, I think that I, I talk a lot. And um, in terms of that particular question, I would I would always if, uh, advocate that patients would speak up, and I, I use the, the the motto "speak up and speak out." You know, um, mm-hmm. I think we're getting better at it. I think that mm-hmm. communication is key. Um, I think that um, patients are getting much better uh, at asking questions. At, um, at, you know, identifying with their care team, you know, any concerns that they have. Um, we talked about the patient concerns inventory earlier on, you know, the, the ability to ask questions, the ability to, to identify or discuss concerns if you're, they're worried about anything is absolutely key. I, I would also say that that, that that confidence to do that is, is, is not always forthcoming. Um, I would always say you need to have someone with you in terms of that trajectory, in terms of those visits, in terms of decision making times. That's a real tip as well in, in, in having support with you. Um, knowing who to contact um, is a huge one. I, I work very closely with the Liam Mac team and they're they're really, really available to patients in terms of providing support. So even the simplest things like knowing who to contact, knowing the numbers um, in to the, the numbers of people to contact in terms of symptoms or concerns that they might have is, is key. You know, we have excellent people in oncology services, you know, oncology liaison nurses or clinical nurse specialists or advanced nurse practitioners. And these are, these are really the best place people, you know, to provide answers to questions and concerns and, and direct them to the supports that are needed as well. So that'd be a real top tip. If, if someone came to me tomorrow saying, Brennan, what should I, you know, what should I really consider? I would say, get that name, you know, get that number of that particular person, that particular person that knows your case inside out, that oncology liaison nurse that is really best positioned to provide that support. And that, that, will, that will absolutely help them to navigate that particular cancer trajectory in the best way possible. Um, you know, you're, we are very much aware from personal experience or from other experience that not knowing the answer to a question is stressful. You know, mm-hmm. knowing who to ask that question to um, is really, really a, a great relief and a great sense of, of relief in terms of providing that support as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Brendan. That was that was very, very interesting. Um, really appreciate your time. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah, thanks, Owen. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It was great.